the first and second day of the chemical wedding of christian rosenkreutz this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by kirk ziegler the chemical wedding of christian rosenkreutz author unknown translated by e foxcroft first and second day the first day on an evening before easter day i sat at a table and having as my custom was in my humble prayer sufficiently conversed with my creator and considered great many mysteries whereof the father of lights his majesty had shown me not a few and being now ready to prepare in my heart together with my dear paschal lamb a small unleavened undefiled cake all on a sudden ariseth so horrible a tempest that i imagined no other that through this mighty force the hill whereon my little house was founded would fly in pieces but inasmuch as this and the like from the devil who had done me many a spite was no new thing to me i took courage and persisted in my meditation till somebody after an unusual manner touched me on the back whereupon i was so hugely terrified that i durst hardly look about me yet i showed myself as cheerful as in the like occurrences humane frailty would permit now the same thing still twitching me several times by the coat i looked back and behold it was a fair and glorious lady whose garments were all sky-color and curiously like heaven bespangled with golden stars in her right hand she bare a trumpet of beaten gold whereupon a name was engraven which i could well read in but am as yet forbidden to reveal it in her left hand she had a great bundle of letters of all languages which she as i afterwards understood was to carry into all countries she had also large and beautiful wings full of eyes throughout wherewith she could mount aloft and fly swifter than any eagle i might perhaps been able to take further notice of her but because she stayed so small time with me and terror and amazement still possessed me i was fain to be content for as soon as i turned about she turned her letters over and over and at length drew out a small one which with great reference she laid down upon the table and without giving one word departed from me but in her mounting upward she gave so mighty a blast on her gallant trumpet that the whole hill echoed thereof and for a full quarter of an hour after i could hardly hear my own words in so unlooked for an adventure i was at a loss how either to advise or assist my poor self and therefore fell upon my knees and besought my creator to permit nothing contrary to my eternal happiness to befall me whereupon with trembling and fear i went to the letter which was now so heavy as it had been meat gold it could hardly have been so weighty now as i was diligently viewing it i found a little seal whereupon a curious cross with this inscription in this sign you will conquer was engraven as soon as i espied this sign i was the more comforted as not being ignorant that such a seal was little acceptable and much less useful to the devil whereupon i tenderly opened the letter and within it in an azure field in golden letters was found the following verses written this day this day this this the royal wedding is art thou thereto by birth inclined and unto joy of god designed then mayst thou to the mountain tend whereupon three stately temples stand and there see from all end to end and keep watch and ward thy self-regard unless with diligence thou bathe the wedding can't thee harmless save he will damage that here delays let him beware too light that weighs as soon as i had read this letter i was presently like to have fainted away all my hair stood on end and a cold sweat trickled down my whole body for although i well perceived that this was the appointed wedding whereof seven years before i was acquainted in a bodily vision and which now so long time i had with great earnestness attended and which lastly by the account and calculation of the planets i had most diligently observed i found so to be yet i could never foresee that it must happen under so grievous and perilous conditions for whereas i before imagined that to be a welcome and acceptable guest i needed only to be ready to appear at the wedding i was now directed to divine providence of which until this time i was never certain i also found by myself the more i examined myself that in my head there was nothing but gross misunderstanding and blindness in mysterious things 
so that i was not able to comprehend even those things which lay under my feet and which i daily conversed with much less that i should be born to searching out and understanding the secrets of nature since in my opinion nature might everywhere find a more virtuous disciple to whom to entrust her precious though temporary and changeable treasures i found also that my bodily behavior and outward good conversation and brotherly love toward my neighbor was not duly purged and cleansed moreover the tickling of the flesh manifested itself whose affection was bent only to pomp and bravery and worldly pride and not to the good of mankind and i was always contriving how by this art i might in a short time abundantly increase my profit and advantage rear up stately palaces make myself an everlasting name in the world and other like carnal designs but the obscure words concerning the three temples did particularly afflict me which i was not able to make out by any after speculation and perhaps should not yet had they not been wonderfully revealed to me thus sticking betwixt hope and fear examining myself again and again and finding only my own frailty and impotency not being in any wise able to succour myself and exceedingly amazed at the aforementioned threatening at length i betook myself to my usual and most secure course after i had finished my earnest and most fervent prayer I laid me down on my bed, so that perchance my good angel, by the divine permission, might appear, and, as it had sometimes formerly happened, instruct me in this doubtful affair, which to the praise of God, my own good, and my neighbor's faithful and hearty warning and amendment did now likewise fall out. For I was yet scarce fallen asleep, when methought, I, together with the numberless multitude of men, lay fettered, with great chains in a dark dungeon wherein without the least glimpse of light we swarmed like bees over one another and thus rendered each other's afflictions more grievous but although neither i nor any of the rest could see one jot yet i continually heard one heaving himself above the other when his chains or fetters were become ever so lighter though none of us had much reason to shove up the other since we were all captive wretches now as i with the rest had continued a good while in this affliction and each was still reproaching the other with his blindness and captivity at length we heard many trumpets sounding together and kettle-drums beating so artificially thereto that it even revived and rejoiced us in our calamity during this noise the cover of the dungeon was from above lifted up and a little light let down unto us the first might truly have been discerned the bustle we kept for all went pestle messel and he who perchance had too much heaved up himself was forced down again under the other's feet in brief each one strove to be uppermost neither did i myself linger but with my weighty fetters slipped up from under the rest and then heaved myself upon a stone which i laid hold of howbeit i was several times caught at by others from whom yet as well as i might with hands and feet i still guarded myself for we imagined no other but that we should all be set at liberty and yet fell out quite otherwise for after the nobles who looked upon us from above through the hole had a while recreated themselves with this our struggling and lamenting a certain hoary-headed ancient man called to us to be quiet and having scarce obtained it began as i still remember thus to say on if wretched mankind could forbear themselves so to uphold then sure on them much good confer my righteous mother could but since the same will not issue they must in care and sorrow rue and still in prison lie howbeit my dear mother will their follies our see her choicest goods permitting still too much in light to be though very rarely it may seem that they may still keep some esteem which else would pass for forgery wherefore in the honour of the feast we this day solemnizes so that her grace may be increased a good deed she devise and now a cord shall be let down and whosoever can hang thereon shall freely be released he had scarce done speaking when an ancient matron commanded her servants to let down the cord seven times into the dungeon and draw up whosoever could hang upon it good god that i could sufficiently describe the hurry and disquiet that then rose amongst us for every one strove to get the cord and yet only hindered each other but after seven minutes a sign was given by a little bell whereupon the first pull the servants drew up four at that time i could not come near the cord by much 
having as before mentioned to my huge misfortune betaken myself to a stone at the wall of the dungeon and thereby was disabled to get to the cord which descended in the middle the cord was let down the second time but divers because of their chains were too heavy and their hands too tender could not keep their hold on the cord but with themselves beat down many other who else perhaps might have held fast enough nay many and one was forcibly pulled off by another yet who could not himself get at it so mutually envious were we even in this our great misery but they of all others most moved my compassion whose weight was so heavy that they tore their very hands from their bodies and yet could not get up thus it came to pass that these five times very few were drawn up for as soon as the sign was given the servants were so nimble at the draughts that the most part tumbled upon one another and the cord this time especially was drawn up very empty whereupon the greatest part and even myself despaired of redemption and called upon god that he would have pity on us and if possible deliver us out of this obscurity who also then heard some of us for when the cord came down the sixth time some of them hung themselves fast upon it and whilst in the drawing up the cord swung from one side to the other it perhaps by the will of god came to me which i suddenly catching uppermost above all the rest and so at length beyond hope i came out whereat i exceedingly rejoiced so that i perceived not the wound which in the drawing up i received on my head by a sharp stone till i with the rest who were released as was always done before was fain to help the seventh and last pull at which time through straining the blood ran down all over my clothes which i nevertheless for joy regarded not now when the last drought whereupon the most of all hung was finished the matron caused the cord to be laid away and willed her aged son at which i much wondered to declare her resolution to the rest of the prisoners who after he had a little bethought himself spoke thus unto him ye children dear all present here what is but now complete and done was long before resolved on and ere my mother of great grace to each both sides here hath shown may never discontent misplace the joyful time is drawing on when every one shall equal be none wealthy none penury who e'er receiveth great commands hath work enough to fill his hands who e'er with much hath trusted been tis well if he may save his skin wherefore your lamentations cease what is it to wait for some few days as soon as he finished these words the cover was again put to and locked down and the trumpets and kettle drums began afresh yet could not the noise thereof be so loud but that the bitter lamentation of the prisoners which arose in the dungeon was heard above all which soon also caused my eyes to run over presently after the ancient matron together with her son sat down upon seats before prepared and commanded the redeemed should be told now as soon as she understood the number and had written it down in a gold yellow tablet she demanded every one's name which were also written down by a little page having viewed us all one after another she sighed and spoke to her son so as i could well hear her ay how heartily i am grieved for the poor men in the dungeon i would to god i durst release them all whereunto her son replied it is mother thus ordained of god against whom we may not contend in case we all of us were lords and possessed of all the goods upon earth and were seated at a table who would there then be to bring up the service whereupon his mother held her peace but soon after she said well however let these be freed from their fetters it was likewise presently done and i except a few was the last yet i could not refrain but though i still looked upon the rest bowed myself before the ancient matron and thanked god that through her had graciously and fatherly vouchsafed to bring me out of such darkness into the light after me the rest did likewise to the satisfaction of the matron lastly to every one was given a piece of gold for a remembrance and to spend the way on the one side whereof was stamped the rising sun on the other as i remember these three letters d l s the three letters d l s which can be translated as god is the light of the sun or praise to god for ever and therewith every one had license to depart and was sent to his own business with this annexed imitation that we to the glory of god should benefit our neighbours and reserve in silence what we had been entrusted with for we also promised to do and so departed from one another but in regard of the wounds which the fetters had caused me i could not well go forward but halted on both feet 
which the matron presently espying laughed at and calling me again to her said thus to me my son let not this defect afflict thee but call to thine infirmities and therewith thank god who hath permitted thee even in this world and in the state of thy imperfection to come into so high a light and keep these wounds for my sake whereupon the trumpets began again to sound and so affrighted me that i awoke and then first perceived that it was only a dream which was so strongly impressed upon my imagination that i was still perpetually troubled about it and methought i was yet sensible of the wounds on my feet howbeit all these things i well understood that god had vouchsafed that i should be present at this mysterious and bidden wedding wherefore with childlike confidence i returned thanks to his divine majesty and besought him that he would further preserve me in this fear that he would daily fill my heart with wisdom and understanding and at length graciously conduct me to the desired end whereupon i prepared myself for the way put on my white linen coat girded my loins with a blood-red ribbon bound crosswise over my shoulder in my hat i stuck four red roses that i might sooner by this token be taken notice of amongst the throng for food i took bread salt and water by which the counsel of an understanding person i had at certain times used not without profit in the like occurrences but before i parted from my cottage i first in this my dress and wedding garment fell down upon my knees and besought god that in case such a thing were he would vouchsafe me a good issue and thereupon in the presence of god i made a vow that if anything through his grace should be revealed unto me i would employ it neither to my own honour nor authority in the world but to the spreading of his name and the service of my neighbour and with this vow and good hope i departed out my cell with joy the second day i was hardly out of my cell into a forest when we thought that the whole heaven and all the elements had already trimmed themselves against this wedding for even the birds in my opinion chanted more pleasantly than before and the young fawn skipped so merrily that they rejoiced my old heart and moved me to sing wherefore with a loud voice i thus began with mirth thy pretty bird rejoice thy maker's praise enhanced lift up thy shrill and pleasant voice thy god is high advanced thy food before he did provide and gives it in a fitting side therewith be thou sufficed why shouldst thou now unpleasant be thy wrath against god venting that he a little bird made thee thy silly head tormenting because he made thee not a man o peace he hath well thought thereon therewith be thou sufficed what is't i'd have poor earthly worm by god by god indicting that i should thus against heaven storm to force great arts by fighting god will outbrave be by none whose good for naught may hence be gone o man be herewith sufficed that he no caesar hath thee framed to pine therefore is needless his name perhaps thou hast defamed whereof he was not heedless most clear and bright god's eyes do shine he pierces thy heart within and cannot be deceived this i sang now from the bottom of my heart throughout the whole forest so that it resounded from all parts and the hills repeated my last words until at length i espied a curious green heath whither i betook myself out of the forest upon this heath stood three lovely tall cedars which by reason of their breadth afforded an excellent and desired shade whereat i greatly rejoiced for although i had not hitherto gone far yet my earnest lodging made me very faint whereupon i hastened to the trees to rest a little under them but as soon as i came somewhat nigher i espied a tablet fastened to one of them on which as afterward i read in curious letters the following words were written good day stranger if perhaps you heard something concerning the wedding of the king consider these words through us the bridegroom offers you a choice of four ways by all those if only you do not sink into the byways you are able to come to his royal court the first is short but dangerous and that one will lead you into rocky places from which you will scarcely be allowed to hasten the second is longer and which will lead you about it will not lead you away it is flat and easy if you allow yourself to be led away neither right nor left by the help of the magnet the third is truly royal which through the various delights and spectacles of our king will render a pleasing journey to you but which so far scarcely befell to one in a thousand by the fourth no man shall be allowed to come to the court since that one is consuming and is only suitable to incorruptible bodies 
Choose now from the three that one you wish, and remain steady on that. However, know whichever you have begun, it is so determined for you by immutable fate, and not to be permissible to return unless with great danger to life. These are what we wish to have known to you. But, hey, beware! You may not know how much danger you committed yourself to this way, for if it entices you, even very little, to be recognized obnoxious against the laws of our king, I beg, while it is still permitted, bring yourself home as soon as possible by the same way that you approached. As soon as I had read this writing, all my joy was near vanished again, and I who sang merrily began now inwardly to lament, for although I saw all the three ways before me, and understood that henceforward it was vouchsafed me to make choice of one of them, yet it troubled me that in case I went the stony and rocky way, I might get a miserable and deadly fall, or taking the long one, I might wander out of it through byways, or be other ways detained in the great journey. Neither durst I hope that I amongst thousands should be the very he who should choose the royal way. I saw likewise the fourth before me, but it was so environed with fire and exultations that I durst not draw near it, and therefore again and again considered whether I should return back or take any of the ways before me. I well waited my own unworthiness, but the dream still comforted me, and I was delivered out of the tower, and yet I durst not confidently rely upon a dream, whereupon I was so variously perplexed, and for their great weariness hunger and thirst seized me whereupon I presently drew out my bread, and cut a slice of it, which a snow-white dove, of whom I was not aware, sitting upon the tree, espied, and therewith, perhaps according to her wonted manner, came down, and betook herself very familiarly to me, to whom I am willing to impart my food, which she received, and so with her prettiness did again a little refresh me. But as soon as her enemy, a most black raven, perceived it, he straight darted himself down upon the dove, and taking no notice of me, would needs force away the dove's meat, who could no otherwise guard herself but by flight. Whereupon they both together flew toward the south, at which I was so hugely incensed and grieved, that without thinking what I did, I made haste after the filthy raven, and so against my will ran into one of the aforementioned ways as a whole field's length, and thus the raven being chased away, and the dove delivered, I then first observed what I had inconsiderately done, and that I was already entered into a way, from which under peril of great punishment I durst not retire. And though I still had herewith in some measure to comfort myself, yet that which was worst of all to me was that I had left my bag and bread at the tree, and could never retrieve them. For as soon as I turned myself about, a contrary wind was so strong against me that it was ready to fell me. But if I went forward on my way, I perceived no hindrance at all, from whence I could easily conclude that it would cost me my life, in case I should set myself against the wind. Wherefore I patiently took up my cross, got upon my feet, and resolved, since so it must be, I would use my utmost endeavour to get to my journey's end before night. Now, although many apparent byways showed themselves, yet I still proceeded with my compass, and would not budge one step from the meridian line how by the way was oft time so rugged and impassable that i was in no little doubt of it on this way i constantly thought upon the dove and the raven and yet could not search out the meaning until at length upon a high hill afar off i spied a stately portal to which not regarding how far it was distant both from me and the way i was in i hastened because the sun had already hid himself under the hills and i could elsewhere espy no abiding place and this verily I ascribe only to God, who might well have permitted me to go forward in this way, and withheld my eyes that so I might have gazed beside this gate, to which, as was said, I now made mighty haste, and reached it by so much daylight, as to take a very competent view of it. Now it was an exceeding royal beautiful portal, upon which were carved a multitude of most noble figures and devices, every one of which, as I learned afterwards, had its peculiar signification. Above was fixed a pretty large tablet with these words, Go far away, far from here, and other things more that I was earnestly forbidden to relate. But now as soon as I was come under the portal, there straight stepped forth one in a sky-coloured habit, whom I in friendly manner saluted, which though he thankfully returned, yet he instantly demanded me of my letter of invitation. 
oh how glad i was that i had then brought it with me for how easily i might have forgotten it as it also chanced to others as he himself told me i quickly presented it wherewith he was not only satisfied but at which i much wondered showed me abundance of respect saying come in my brother an acceptable guest you are to me and withal entreated me not to withhold my name from him now having replied that i was a brother of the rosy cross he both wondered and seemed to rejoice at it then proceeded thus my brother have you nothing about you wherewith to purchase a token i answered my ability was small but if he saw anything about me he had a mind to it was at his service now having requested of me my bottle of water and i granted it he gives me a golden token whereupon stood no more but these two letters s c the two letters s c may stand for constancy by holiness beloved bridegroom hope charity entreating me that when it stood me in good stead i would remember him after which i asked him how many were got in before me which he also told me and lastly out of mere friendship gave me a sealed letter to the second porter now having lingered some time with him the night grew on whereupon a great beacon upon the gates was immediately fired that so if any were still upon the way he might make haste thither but the way where it finished at the castle was on both sides enclosed with walls and planted with all sorts of excellent fruit trees and still on every third tree on each side lanthorns were hung up wherein at the candles were already lighted with glorious torch by a beautiful virgin habited in sky color which was so noble and majestic a spectacle that i yet delayed somewhat longer than was requisite but at length after sufficient information and an advantageous instruction i friendly departed from the first porter on the way though i would have gladly have known what was written in my letter yet since i had no reason to mistrust the porter i forbear my purpose and so went on the way until i came likewise to the second gate which although it was very like the other yet it was adorned with images and mystic significations in the affixed tablet stood give and it will be given to you under this gate lay a terrible grim lion chained who as soon as he espied me rose and made at me with great roaring whereupon the second porter who lay upon a stone of marble awakened and wished me not to be troubled or affrighted and then drove back the lion and having received the letter which i with trembling reached him he read it and with very great respect spake to me thus thou welcome in god's name unto me the man whom of long time i would have gladly seen meanwhile he also drew out a token and asked me whether i could purchase it but having nothing else left but my salt presented it to him which he thankfully accepted upon this token again stood two letters namely s m which can be translated as by the study of a deserving man to be given to the bridegroom mineral salt menstrual salt being now just about to enter discourse with him it began to ring in the castle whereupon the porter counselled me to run apace or else all the pains and labour i had hitherto taken would serve no purpose for the lights above began already to be extinguished whereupon i dispatched with such haste that i heeded not the porter in such anguish was i and truly it was necessary for i could not run so fast but that the virgin after whom all the lights were put out was at my heels and i should never have found the way had she not with her torch afforded me some light i was moreover constrained to enter the very next to her and the gate was so suddenly clapped to that a part of my coat was locked out which i verily was forced to leave behind me for neither i nor they who stood ready without and called at the gate could prevail with the porter to open it again but he delivered the keys to the virgin who took them with her to the court meantime i again surveyed the gate which now appeared so rich as the whole world could not equal it just by the door were two columns one of them stood a pleasant figure with this inscription i congratulate the other having its countenance veiled was sad and beneath was written i condole in brief the inscriptions and figures thereon were so dark and mysterious that the most dexterous man upon earth could not have expounded them but all of these i shall ere long publish and explain under this gate i was again to give my name which was this last time written down in a little vellum book and immediately with the rest dispatched to the lord bridegroom here it was where i first received the true guest token it was somewhat less than the former but much heavier upon this stood the letters s p n which are translated as 
to be given at the bridegroom's wedding, healing through nature. Besides this, a new pair of shoes were given me, for the floor of the castle was laid with pure shang marble. My old shoes I was to give away to one of the poor who sat in throngs, howbeit in very good order under the gate. I then bestowed them on an old man, after which two pages with as many torches conducted me into a little room, where they willed me to sit down on a form, which I did, but they sticking their torches in two holes, made in the pavement, departed and left me thus sitting alone. Soon after I heard a noise, but saw nothing, and it proved to be certain men who stumbled in upon me, but since I could see nothing I was fain to suffer, and attended what they would do with me, but presently, perceiving them to be barbers, I entreated them not to justle me so, for I was content to do whatever they desired, whereupon they quickly let me go. And so one of them, who I could not yet see, fine and gently cut away the hair round about from the crown of my head but on my forehead, ears, and eyes he permitted my ice-gray locks to hang. In his first encounter, I must confess, I was ready to despair, for inasmuch as some of them shoved me so forcibly, and I could not yet see nothing, I could think no other but that of God for my curiosity had suffered me to miscarry. Now these invisible barbers carefully gathered up the hair which was cut off, and carried it away with them. After which the two pages entered again, and heartily laughed at me for being so terrified but they had scarce spoken a few words with me, when again a little bell began to ring, which, as the pages informed me, was to give notice for assembling, whereupon they willed me to rise, and through many walks, doors, and winding stairs lighted me into a spacious hall. In this room was a great multitude of guests, emperors, kings, princes and lords, noble and ignoble, rich and poor, and all sorts of people, at which I hugely marvelled, and thought to myself, ah how a gross fool hast thou been to engage upon this journey with so much bitterness and toil when here are even those fellows whom thou well knowest and yet hast never any reason to esteem they are now all here and thou with all thy prayers and supplications art hardly got in at last this and more the devil at that time injected whom i notwithstanding as well as i could directed to the issue Meantime, one or other of my acquaintance here and there spake to me, O brother Roisenkreutz, art thou here too? Yea, my brother, and I replied, The grace of God hath helped me in also. That which they raised a mighty laughter, looking upon it as ridiculous that there should be need of God in so slight an occasion. Now having demanded each of them concerning his way, I found that most were forced to clamber over the rocks. Certain trumpets, none of which we yet saw, began to sound to the table whereupon they all seated themselves, every one as he judged himself above the rest, so that for me and some other sorry fellows there was hardly a little nook left at the lowermost table. Presently the two pages entered, and one of them said grace in so handsome and excellent manner as rejoiced the very heart in my body. Howbeit, certain great Johns made but little reckoning of them, but flared and winked at one another, biting their lips within their hats, and using more the like unseemly gestures. After this meat was brought in, and albeit none could be seen, yet everything was so orderly managed, that it seemed to me as if every guest had had his proper attendant. Now my artists, having somewhat recruited themselves, and the wine having a little removed shame from their hearts, they presently began to vaunt and brag of their abilities. One would prove this, another that, and commonly the most sorry idiots made the loudest noise. Ah, when I call to mind what preternatural and impossible enterprises I then heard, I am still ready to vomit at it. In fine, they never kept in their order, but whenever one rascal here, another there, could insulate himself in between the nobles, then pretended they were the finishing of such adventures as neither Samson nor yet Hercules with all their strength could ever have achieved. This would discharge Atlas of his burden. The other would again draw forth the three-headed Cerebus out of hell. In brief, every man had his own prate, and yet the great lords were so simple that they believed their pretenses, and the rogues so audacious, and although one or another of them was here and there wrapped over the fingers with a knife, yet they flinched not at it. But when one perchance had filched a gold chain, then would all hazard for the like. I saw one who heard the rustling of heavens. The second could see Plato's ideas. A third could number Democritus's atoms there were also not a few pretenders to the perpetual motion many and one in my opinion had good understanding 
but assumed too much to himself to his own destruction lastly there was one also who would needs out of hand persuade us that he saw the servitors who attended and would still have pursued his contention had not one of those invisible waiters reached him so handsome a cuff upon his lying muzzle that not only he but many more who were by him became as mute as mice but it best of all pleased me that all those of whom i had any esteem were very quiet in their business and made no loud cry of it but acknowledged themselves to be misunderstanding men to whom the mysteries of nature were too high and they themselves much too small in this tumult i had almost cursed the day wherein i came hither for i could not but with anguish behold those lewd vain people who were above at the board but i in so sorry a place could not however rest in quiet one of these rascals scornfully reproaching me for a motley fool now i thought not that there was yet one gate behind though which we must pass but imagined i was during the whole wedding to continue in the scorn contempt and indignity which i yet had no time deserved either the lord bridegroom or the bride and therefore in my opinion he should have done well to have sought out some other fool to his wedding than me behold to such impatience doth the iniquity of this world reduce simple hearts but this really was one part of my lameness whereof as before mentioned i dreamed and truly this clamour the longer it lasted the more it increased for there were already those who boasted of false and imaginary visions who would persuade us of palpably lying dreams now there sat by me a very fine quiet man who oftentimes discoursed of excellent matters at length he said behold my brother if any one should now come who were willing to instruct these blockish people in the right way would he be heard no verily replied i the world said he is now resolved whatever comes on it to be cheated and cannot abide to give ear to those who intend its good seest thou also that same coxcomb with that whimsical figure and foolish conceit he allures others to him there one makes mouths at the people with the unheard of mysterious words yet believe me in this the time is now coming when those shameful lizards shall be plucked off and all the world shall know what vagabond impostors were concealed behind them then perhaps that will be valued which is at present not esteemed whilst he was thus speaking and the clamour the longer it lasted the worse it was all of a sudden there began in the hall such excellent and stately music as all the days of my life i never heard the like whereupon every one held his peace and attended what would become of it now there were in this music all sorts of stringed instruments imaginable which sounded together in such harmony that i forgot myself and so sat unmovable and those who sat by me were amazed at me and this lasted near half an hour wherein none of us spake one word for as soon as ever any one was about to open his mouth he got an unexpected blow neither knew he from whence it came methought since we were not permitted to see the musicians i should have been glad to view only all the instruments they made use of after a half an hour this music ceased unexpectedly we could neither see nor hear anything further presently after before the door of the hall began a great noise sounding and beating of trumpets shalms and kettle-drums also master-like as if the emperor of rome had been entering whereupon the door opened of itself and then the noise of the trumpets was so loud that we were hardly able to endure it meanwhile to my thinking many thousand small tapers came into the hall all which of themselves marched in so very exact order as altogether amazed us till at last the two aforementioned pages with bright torches lighting in a most beautiful virgin all drawn on a glorious gilded trumpet self-moving throne entered the hall it seemed to me that she was the very same who before me on the way kindled and put out the lights and these her attendants were the very same who she formerly placed at the trees she was not now as before in sky color but arrayed in a snow-white glittering robe which sparkled of pure gold and cast such a lustre that we durst not steadily behold it both pages were after the same manner habited all but somewhat more slightly as soon as they were come into the middle of the hall and were descended from the throne all the small tares made obeisance before her whereupon we all stood up from our benches yet every one stayed in his own place now she was having to us and we again to her showed all respect and reverence and in a most pleasant tone she began thus to speak the king my lord most gracious 
who now is not very far from us, as also his most lovely bride, to whom in troth and honour tied, already with great joy endued, have your arrival hither viewed, and do to every one and all promise their grace in special, and from their very heart's desire you may at the time acquire, and so their future nuptial joy may be mixed with none's annoy whereupon with all her small tapers she again courteously bowed and presently after began thus in the invitation writ you know that no man called was hereto who of god's rarest gifts good store had not received long before adorned with all requisites and in such cases it benefits how though they cannot well conceit that any man so desperate under conditions so hard here to intrude without regard unless he have first of all prepared for this nuptial and therefore in good hopes do dwell that with you all will be well yet men are grown so bold and rude not weighing their ineptitude and still to thrust themselves in place where to none of them called was no coxcomb here himself may sell no rascal with the other steal for they resolve without all let a wedding pure to celebrate so then the artist for to weigh scale shall be fixed the ensuing day whereby each one may lightly find what hath left at home behind let him pack quickly hence aside for in that case he no longer bide of grace forlorn and quite undone betimes he must the gauntlet run if any now his conscience gall he shall to-night be left in the hall and be again released by morn so he hither never return if any man have confidence he with his waiter may go hence who shall him to his chamber light where he may rest in peace to-night and therewith praise await the scale or else his sleep may chance to fail the others here may take it well for who aims what's possible it were better much he hence had passed but of you all we hope the best as soon as she had done speaking this she again made reverence and sprung cheerfully into her throne after which the trumpets began again to sound which yet was not of force to take from many their grievous sighs so they again conducted her invisibly away but for the most part of the small tappers remained in the room and still some of them accompanied each of us in such perturbation it is not well possible to express what pensive thoughts and gestures were amongst us yet the most part resolved to await the scale and in case things sorted out not well to depart as they hoped in peace i had soon cast up my reckoning and being my conscience convinced me of all ignorance and unworthiness i proposed to stay with the rest in the hall and choose much rather to content myself with the meal i had already taken than to run the risk of a future repulse now that every one by a small taper had severally been conducted into a chamber each as i since understood to be a peculiar one there stayed nine of us and amongst the rest he also who discoursed with me before at the table but although our small tapers left us not yet soon after within an hour's time one of the forementioned pages came in and bringing a great bundle of cords with him first demanded of us whether we had concluded to stay here which when we had with sighs affirmed he bound each of us in a several place and so went away with our small tapers and left us poor wretches in the darkness then first began some to perceive the imminent danger and i myself could not refrain tears for although we were not forbidden to speak yet anguish and affliction suffered none of us to utter one word for the cords were so wonderfully made yet none could cut them much less get them off his feet yet this comforted me and still the future gain of many and one who had now betaken himself to rest would prove very little to his satisfaction but we by only one night's penance might expiate all our presumption till at length in my sorrowful thoughts i fell asleep during which i had a dream now although there be no great matter in it yet i esteem it not impertinent to recount methought i was upon a high mountain and saw before me a great and large valley in this valley were gathered together an unspeakable multitude of people each of which had at his head a thread by which he was hanged up towards heaven now one hung high another low some stood even quiet upon the earth but in the air there flew up and down an ancient man who had in his hand a pair of shears here with here he cut ones and there another's thread now he that was nigh the earth was so much the readier and fell without noise 
but when it happened to one of the high ones he fell so that the earth quaked to some it came to pass that their thread was so stretched that they came to the earth before the thread was cut i took pleasure in this tumbling and it joyed me at the heart when he who had overexalted himself in the air of his wedding got so shameful a fall that it carried even some of his neighbors along with him in like manner it also rejoiced me that he who had all this while kept himself near the earth should come down so fine and gently that even his next men perceived it not but being now in my highest fit of jollity i was unawares jogged by one of my fellow captives upon which i was awakened and was very much discontented with him howbeit i considered my dream and recounted it to my brother who lay by me on the other side who was not dissatisfied with it but hoped some comfort might thereby be pretended in such discourse we spent the remaining part of the night and with longing expected the day end of the first and second day recording by kirk ziegler ogden utah voiceovers by kirk dot com of the chemical wedding of christian rosenkreutz author unknown translated by e foxcroft this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by kurt ziegler now as soon as the lovely day was broken and the bright sun having raised himself above the hills had again betaken himself in the high heaven to his appointed office my good champions began to rise out of their beds and leisurely to make themselves ready unto the inquisition whereupon one after another they came again into the hall and giving us a good morrow demanded how we had slept to-night and having espied our bonds there were some that reproved us for being so cowardly and that we had not as they hazard upon all adventures howbeit some of those whose hearts still smote them made no loud cry of the business we excused ourselves with our ignorance hoping that we should now soon be set at liberty and learned wit by this disgrace that they on the contrary had not yet altogether escaped and perhaps their greatest danger was still to be expected at length each one being again assembled the trumpets began now again to sound and the kettle drums to beat as formerly and we then imagined no other but that the bridegroom was ready to present himself which nevertheless was a huge mistake for again it was the yesterday's virgin who had arrayed herself all in red velvet and girded herself with a white scarf upon her head she had a green wreath of laurel which hugely became her her train was now no more of small tapers but consisted of two hundred men in harness who were all like her clothed in red and white as soon as they were alighted from the throne she comes straight to us prisoners and after she had saluted us she said in a few words that some of you have been sensible of your wretched condition is hugely pleasing to my most mighty lord and he is also resolved you shall fare better for it and having espied me in my habit she laughed and spake good lack hast thou also submitted thyself to the yoke i imagined thou wouldst have made thyself very smug with which word she caused my eyes to run over after which she commanded we should be unbound and coupled together and placed in a station where we might behold the scales for said she it may yet better fare with them than with the presumptuous who yet stands here at liberty meantime the scales which were entirely of gold were hung up in the midst of the hall there was also a little table covered with red velvet and seven weights placed thereon first of all stood a pretty great one next four little ones lastly two great ones severally and these weights in proportion to their bulk were so heavy that no man can believe or comprehend it but each of the harnessed men had together with a naked sword a strong rope and she distributed according to the number of weights into seven bands and out of every band chose one for their proper weight and then again sprung up into her high throne now as soon as she had made her reverence with a very shrill tone she thus began to speak who into a painter's room does go and nothing does of painting know yet does in prating thereof pride it shall be of all the world derided who into the artist order goes and hereunto was never chose yet with pretence of skill does pride it shall be of all the world derided who at a wedding does appear and yet was never intended there yet does it come highly pride it 
shall be of all the world derided who now into this scale ascends the weights not proving his fast friends and that it bounces so does ride it shall be of all the world derided as soon as the virgin had done speaking one of the pages commanded each one to place himself according to his order and one after another stepped in which one of the emperors made no scruple of but first of all bowed himself a little towards the virgin and afterwards in his stately attire went up whereupon each captain laid in his weight which to the wonder of all he stood out but the last was too heavy for him so that forth he must and that with much anguish that as it seemed to me the virgin herself had pity on him who also beckoned to her people to hold their peace yet it was the good emperor bound and delivered over to the sixth band next him again came forth another emperor who stepped haughtily into the scale and having a great thick book under his gown he imagined not to fail but being scarce able to abide the third weight and being unmercifully flung down and his book in that affrightment flipping from him all the soldiers began to laugh and he was delivered up bound to the third band thus it went also with some of the other emperors who were all shamefully laughed at and captivated after these comes forth a little short man with a curled brown beard an emperor too who after the usual reverence got up also and held out so steadfastly that methought and there had been more weights ready he would have outstood them to whom the virgin immediately arose and bowed before him causing him to put on a gown of red velvet and at last reached him a branch of laurel having good store of them upon her throne upon the steps whereof she willed him to sit down now how after it fared with the rest of the emperors kings and lords would be too long to recount but i cannot leave unmentioned that a few of those great personages held out how by sundry eminent virtues beyond my hopes were found in many no one could stand out this the second another some two some three four or five but few could attain to just the perfection but every one who failed was miserably laughed at by the bands after the inquisition had passed over the gentry the learned and unlearned and the rest and in each condition perhaps one it may be two but for the most part none was found perfect it came at length to those honest gentlemen the vagabond cheaters and the rascally makers who were set upon the scale with such scorn that i myself for all my grief was ready to burst from my belly with laughing neither could the very prisoners themselves refrain for the most part could not abide that severe trial but with whips and scourges were jerked out of the scale and led to the other prisoners yet to a suitable band thus so great a throng so few remained and i am ashamed to discover their number howbeit there were persons of quality also amongst them for notwithstanding were like the rest honoured with velvet robes and wreaths of laurel the inquisition being completely finished and none but we poor coupled hounds standing aside at length one of the captains stepped forth and said gracious madam if it please your ladyship let these poor men who acknowledge their misunderstanding be set upon the scale also without their incurring any danger of penalty and only for recreation's sake if perchance anything that is found might be amongst them in the first place i was in great perplexity for in my anguish this was my only comfort that i was not to stand in such ignominy or to be lashed out of the scale for i nothing doubted but that many of the prisoners wished that they had stayed ten nights with us in the hall yet since the virgin consented so it must be and we being untied were one after another set up now although the most part miscarried yet they were neither laughed at nor scourged but peaceably placed on one side my companion was the fifth who held out bravely whereupon all but especially the captain who made the request for us applauded him and the virgin showed him the usual respect after him again two more were dispatched in an instant but i was the eighth now as soon as with trembling i stepped up my companion who had already sat by in his velvet looked friendly upon me and the virgin herself smiled a little but for as much as i stayed out all the weights the virgin commanded them to draw me up by force wherefore three men moreover hung on the other side of the beam and yet could nothing prevail whereupon one of the pages immediately stood up and cried out loud exceedingly loud that is he upon which the other replied then let him gain his liberty 
which the virgin accorded and being received with due ceremonies the choice was given me to release one of the captives whomsoever i pleased whereupon i made no long deliberation but elected the first emperor whom i had long pitied who was immediately set free and with all respect seated amongst us now the last being set up and the weights proving too heavy for him in the meanwhile the virgin espied my roses which i had taken out of my hat into my hands and thereupon presently by her page graciously requested them of me which i readily sent her and so this first act was finished about ten in the forenoon whereupon the trumpets again began to sound which nevertheless we could not yet see meantime the bands were to step aside with their prisoners and expect the judgment after which a council of the seven captains and us was set and the business was propounded by the virgin as president who desired each one to give his opinion how the prisoners were to be dealt with the first option was that they should be all put to death yet one more severely than another namely those who had presumptuously intruded themselves contrary to the express conditions others would have them kept close prisoners both which pleased neither the president nor me at length by one of the emperors the same whom i had freed my companion and myself the affair was brought to this point the first of all the principal lords should with the befitting respect be let out of the castle others might be carried out somewhat more scornfully these would be stripped and caused to run out naked the fourth with rods whips or dogs should be hunted out those who the day before willingly surrendered themselves might be suffered to depart without any blame and last of all those presumptuous ones and they who behaved themselves so unseemly at dinner the day before should be punished in body and life according to each man's demerit this option pleased the virgin well and obtained the upper hand there was moreover another dinner vouchsafed them which they were soon acquainted with but the execution was deferred till twelve at noon herewith the senate arose and the virgin also together with her attendants returned to her usual quarter but the uppermost table in the room was allotted to us they requested us to take it in good part till the business were fully dispatched and then we should be conducted to the lord bridegroom and the bride with which we were at present well content meantime the prisoners were again brought into the hall and each man seated according to his quality they were likewise enjoined to behave themselves somewhat more civilly than they had done the day before which yet they needed not to have been admonished for without this they had already put up their pipes and this i can boldly say not with flattery but in the love of truth that commonly those persons who were of the highest rank best understood how to behave themselves in so unexpected a misfortune their treatment was but indifferent yet with respect neither could they see their attendants but to us they were visible whereat i was exceedingly joyful now although fortune had exalted us yet we looked not upon us more than the rest advising them to be of good cheer the event would not be so ill now although they would gladly have understood the sentence of us yet we were so deeply obliged that none durst open his mouth about it nevertheless we comforted them as well as we could drinking with them to try the wine might make them anything cheerfuller our table was covered with a red velvet beset with drinking cups of pure silver and gold the rest which could not behold without amazement and very great anguish but ere we had seated ourselves in came two pages presenting every one in the bridegroom's behalf the golden fleece with a flying lion requesting us to wear them at the table and as became us to observe the reputation and dignity of the order which his majesty had now vouchsafed us and should suddenly be ratified with suitable ceremonies this we received with profoundest submission promising obediently to perform whatsoever his majesty should please besides these the noble page had a schedule wherein we were set down in order and for my part i should not otherwise be desirous to conceal my place if perchance it might not be interpreted to pride in me which yet is expressly against the fourth weight now because our entertainment was exceedingly stately we demanded one of the pages whether we might not leave to send some choice bit to our friends and acquaintance who making no difficulty of it every one sent plentifully to his acquaintance by the waiters howbeit they saw none of them and forasmuch as they knew not whence it came it was myself desirous to carry somewhat to one of them but as soon as i was risen 
one of the waiters was presently at my elbow saying he desired me to take a friendly warning for in case one of the pages had seen it it would have come to the king's ear who would certainly have taken it amiss of me but since none had observed it but himself he proposed not to betray me but that i ought for the time to have come better regard to the dignity of the order with which words the servant did really so astonish me that for a long time after i scarce moved upon my seat yet i returned him thanks for his faithful warning as well as in haste and affrightment i was able soon after the drums began to beat again to which we were already accustomed for we knew well it was the virgin wherefore we prepared ourselves to receive her who was now coming in with her usual train upon her high seat one of the pages bearing before her a very tall goblet of gold and the other a patent in parchment now being after a marvellous artificial manner alighted from the seat she takes the goblet from the page and presents the same in the king's behalf saying that it was brought from his majesty and that in honour of him we should cause it to go round upon the cover of this goblet stood fortune curiously cast in gold who had in her hand a red flying ensign for which cause i drunk somewhat more sadly and having been but too well acquainted with fortune's waywardness but the virgin as well as we was adorned with the golden fleece and lion whence i observed that perhaps she was the president of the order wherefore we demanded of her how the order might be named she answered that it was not yet seasonable to discover it till the affair with the prisoners were dispatched and therefore their eyes were still held and what had hitherto happened to us was to them only for an offence and scandal although it were to be accounted as nothing in regard to the honour that attended us hereupon she began to distinguish the patent which the other page held into different parts out of which about thus much was read before the first company that they should confess that they had too lightly given credit to false fictitious books had assumed too much to themselves and so came into this castle albeit they were never invited into it and perhaps the most part had presented themselves with design to make their market here and afterwards to live in the greater pride and lordliness and thus one had seduced another and plunged him into this disgrace and ignominy wherefore they were deservedly to be soundly punished which they with great humility readily acknowledged and gave their hands upon it after which a severe check was given to the rest much to this purpose that they very well knew and were in their consciences convinced that they had forged false fictitious books had befooled others and cheated them and hereby had diminished regal dignity amongst all they all knew in like manner what ungodly deceitful figures they had made use of insomuch as they spared not even the divine trinity but accustomed themselves to cheat people all the country over it was also now as clear as day that with the practices that they had endeavoured to ensnare the true guests and introduce the ignorant in a like manner that it was manifest to all the world they wallowed in the open whoredom adultery gluttony and other uncleanliness all which was against the express order of our kingdom in brief they knew they had disparaged king majesty even amongst the common sort and therefore they should confess themselves to be manifest convicted vagabond cheaters knaves and rascals whereby they deserved to be cashiered from the company of civil people and severely to be punished the good artists were loath to come to this confession but inasmuch as not only the virgin herself threatened and swear their death but the other party also vehemently raged at them and unanimously cried out that they had most wickedly seduced them out of the light they at length to prevent a huge misfortune confessed the same with duller and yet withal alleged that what had herein happened was not to be amniverted upon them in the worst sense for inasmuch as the lords were absolutely resolved to get into the castle and had promised great sums of money to that effect each one had used all gaffed to seize upon something and so things were brought to that pass as was now manifest before their eyes but that it succeeded not they in their opinion had deserved no more than the lords themselves as who should have had so much understanding as to consider that in any case any one had been sure of getting in he would not in so great a peril for the sake of slight gain have clambered over the wall with them their books also sold mightily that whoever had no other mean to maintain himself was fain to engage in such cousinage they hoped moreover that if a right judgment were made 
that they should be found no way to have miscarried, and having behaved themselves towards the lords, as became servants, upon their earnest entreaty. But the answer was made them, that his royal majesty had determined to punish all, and every man, albeit one more severely than another. For although what had been alleged by them was partly true, and therefore the lord should not be wholly indulged yet, they had good reason to prepare themselves for death, who had so presumptuously obtruded themselves, and perhaps seduced the more ignorant against their will, as likewise they who with false books had violated royal majesty, as the same might be invinced out of their very writings and books. Hereupon many began most piteously to lament, cry, weep, entreat, and prostrate themselves, all which notwithstanding could avail them nothing, and I much marvelled how the virgin could be so resolute, when yet their misery caused our eyes to run over, and moved our compassion, although the most part of them had procured us much trouble and vexation, for she presently dispatched her page, who brought with him all the cursiers, which had this day been appointed at the scales, who were commanded each of them to take his own to him, and in an orderly procession, so as still each cursier could go with one of the prisoners, to conduct them into her great garden, at which time each one so exactly recognized his own man that I marvelled at it. Leave was also likewise given to my yesterday companions to go out into the garden unbound, and to be present at the execution of the sentence. Now, as soon as every man was come forth, the virgin mounted up into her high throne, requesting us to sit down upon the steps, and to appear at the judgment, which we refused not, but left all standing upon the table, except the goblet, which the virgin committed to the page's keeping, and went forth in our robes upon the throne, which of itself moved so gently as if we had passed in the air, till in this manner we came into the garden, where we rose altogether. This garden was not extraordinary curious, only it pleased me that the trees were planted in so good order. Besides, there ran in it a most costly fountain, adorned with wonderful figures and inscriptions and strange characters, which, God willing, I shall mention in a future book. In this garden was raised a wooden scaffold, hung about with curiously painted figure coverlets. Now there were four galleries, made one over another. The first was more glorious than any of the rest, and therefore covered with a white taffeta curtain, so that at that time we could not perceive who was behind it. The second was empty and uncovered. Again, the two last were covered with red and blue taffeta. Now as soon as we were come to the scaffold, the virgin bowed herself down to the ground, at which we were mightily terrified, for we might easily guess that the king and queen must not be off far. Now we also, having duly performed our reverence, the virgin leads us up by the winding stairs into the second gallery, where she placed herself uppermost, and us in our former order. But how the emperor, whom I had released, behaved himself towards me, both at this time, as also before the table, I cannot, without slander of wicked tongues, well relate. For he might well imagine, in what anguish and solicitude, he now should have been, in case he were at present to attend the judgment with such ignominy, and that only through me he had not attained such dignity and worthiness. Meantime, the virgin who first of all brought me the invitation, and whom hitherto I had never since seen, stepped in, for she gave one blast upon her trumpet, and then with a very loud voice declared the sentence in this manner. The King's Majesty, my most gracious Lord, could from his heart wish, that all and every one here assembled, had upon his Majesty's invitation presented themselves so qualified, as they might, to his honour, with great frequency have adorned this appointed nuptial and joyful feast. But since it hath otherwise pleased Almighty God, His Majesty hath not whereat to murmur, but must be forced, contrary to his own inclination, to abide by the ancient and laudable constitutions of this kingdom. But now that His Majesty's innate clemency may be celebrated all over the world, he hath thus far absolutely dealt with his council and estates, that the usual sentence shall be considerably lenified so that in the first place he is willing to vouchsafe to the lords and potentates not only their lives entirely but also freely and frankly to dismiss them friendly and courteously entreating your lordships not at all to take it in evil part that you cannot be present at his majesty's feast of honour but to remember that there is notwithstanding more imposed upon your lordships by god almighty than you can duly and easily sustain 
neither is your reputation hereby prejudiced although you be rejected by this order since we cannot at once all of us do all things but forasmuch as your lordships have been seduced by base rascals it shall not on their part pass unrevenged and furthermore his majesty resolveth shortly to communicate with your lordships a catalogue of heretics or index expurgatorius that you may henceforth be able with better judgment to discern between the good and evil and because his majesty ere long also purposeth to rummage his library and offer up the seductive writings to vulcan he friendly humbly and courteously entreats every one of your lordships to put the same in execution with your own whereby it is to be hoped that all evil and mischief may for the time to come be remedied and you are withal to be admonished never henceforth to inconsiderately to covet an entrance hither lest the former excuse of the seducers be taken from you and you fall into disgrace and contempt with all men in fine for as much as the estates of land have still somewhat to demand of your lordships his majesty hopes that no man will think much to redeem himself with a chain or what else he hath about him and so in friendly manner to depart from us and through our safe conduct to betake himself home again the others who stood not at the first third and fourth way his majesty will not so lightly dismiss but that they also may now experience his majesty's gentleness it is his command to strip them stark naked and so send them forth those who in the second and fifth weight were found too light shall besides stripping be noted with one two or more brand marks according as each one was lighter or heavier they who were drawn up by the sixth or seventh and not by the rest shall be somewhat more graciously dealt with and so forward for unto every combination there was a certain punishment ordained which were here too long to count they who yesterday separated themselves freely of their own accord shall go out at liberty without any blame finally the convicted vagabond cheaters who could move up none of the weights shall as occasion serves be punished in body and life with the sword halder water and rods and such execution of judgment shall be invoidably observed for an example unto others herewith our virgin broke her wand and the other who read the sentence blowed her trumpet and stepped with utmost profound reverence towards those who stood behind the curtain but here i cannot omit to discover somewhat to the reader concerning the number of our prisoners of whom those who weighed one were seven those who weighed two were twenty-one they who three thirty-five they who four thirty-five those who five twenty-one those who six seven but he that came to the seventh and yet could not well raise it he was only one and indeed the same whom i released besides of them who wholly failed there were many but of those who drew all the weights from the ground but few and these as they stood severally before us so i diligently numbered and noted them down in my table-book and it is very admirable that amongst all those who weighed anything none was equal to another for although amongst those who weighed three there were thirty-five yet none of them weighed the first second and third another the third fourth and fifth a third the fifth sixth and seventh and so on it is likewise very wonderful that amongst one hundred and twenty-six who weighed anything none was equal to another and i would very willingly name them all with each man's weight were it not yet as forbidden me but i hope it may hereafter be published with the interpretation now this judgment being read over the lords in the first place were well satisfied because in such severity they durst not look for a mild sentence for which cause they gave more than they were desired and each one redeemed himself with chains jewels gold monies and other things as much as they had about them and with reverence took leave now although the king's servants were forbidden to jeer any at his going away and yet some unlucky birds could not hold laughing and certainly it was sufficiently ridiculous to see them pack away with such speed without once looking behind them some desired that the promised catalogue might be the first be dispatched after them and then they could take such order with their books as should be pleasing to his majesty which again was assured at the door was given to each of them a cup of draught of forgetfulness so that he might have no further memory of misfortune after these the volunteers departed who because of their ingenuity were suffered to pass but yet so as never to return again in the same fashion 
but to them as likewise to the others anything further were revealed then they should be welcome guests meanwhile others were stripping in which also an inequality according to each man's demerit was observed they were sent away naked without other hurt others were driven out with small bells some were scourged forth in brief the punishment were so various that i am not able to recount them all in the end it came to the last also with whom somewhat longer time was spent for whilst some were hanging some beheading some forced to leap into the water and the rest otherwise dispatching much time was consumed verily at this execution my eyes ran over not indeed in regard of the punishment which they otherwise for their impudency well deserved but in contemplation of human blindness in that we are continually abusing ourselves in that which ever since the first fall hath been hitherto sealed up to us thus the garden which so lately was quite full was soon emptied so that besides the soldiers there was not a man left now as soon as this was done and silence had been kept for the pace of five minutes there came forward a beautiful snow-white unicorn with a golden coffer having in it certain letters about his neck in the same place he bowed himself down upon both his forefeet as if thereby he had shown honour to the lion who stood so immovably upon the fountain that i took him to be one of stone or brass who immediately took the naked sword which he bare in his paw and break it in the middle in two the pieces whereof to my thinking had sunk into the fountain after which he so long roared until a white dove brought a branch of olive in her bill which the lion devoured in an instant and was so quieted and so the unicorn returned to his place with joy hereupon our virgin led us down again by the winding stairs from the scaffold and so we again made our reverence toward the curtain we were to wash our hands and heads in the fountain and there a little while to wait in our order till the king through a certain secret gallery were again returned to his hall and then we also with choice music pomp state and pleasant discourse were conducted into our former lodging and this was done about four in the afternoon but that in the meanwhile the time might not seem too long to us the virgin bestowed on each of us a noble page who were not only richly habited but also exceedingly learned so that they could so aptly discourse upon all subjects that we had good reason to be ashamed of ourselves these were commanded to lead us up and down the castle yet but into certain places and if possible to shorten the time according to our desire meantime the virgin took leave with this consolation that at supper she would be with us again and after that celebrate the ceremonies of the hanging up of the weights requesting that we would in patience wait till the next day for on the morrow we must be presented to the king she being thus departed from us each of us did what best pleased him one part viewed the excellent paintings which they occupied out for themselves and considered also what the wonderful characters might signify others were fain to recruit themselves again with meat and drink i indeed caused my page to conduct me together with my companion up and down the castle of which walk it will never repent me as long as i have a day to live for besides many other glorious antiquities the royal sepulchre was also showed me by which i learned more than is existent in all books there in the same place also stands the glorious phoenix of which two years since i published a small discourse and am resolved in case this my narration shall prove useful to set forth several and peculiar treatises concerning the lion eagle griffin falcon and other like together with their droughts and inscriptions it grieves me also for my other conforts that they neglected such prettiest treasures and yet i cannot but think it was special will of god it should be so i indeed reap the most benefit by my page for according as each one's genius lay so he led his entrusted into the quarters and places which were pleasing to him now the keys hereunto belonging were committed to my page and therefore his good fortune happened to me before the rest for although he invited others to come in yet they imagined such tombs to be only in the churchyard thought they should well enough get thither whenever anything was to be seen there neither shall these monuments as both of us copied and transcribed them be withheld from my thankful scholars the other thing that was showed us too was the noble library as it was altogether before the reformation of which albeit it rejoices my heart as often as i can call it to mind i have so much the less to say 
because the catalogue thereof is very shortly to be published at the entry of this great room stands a great book the like of whereof i never saw in which all the figures rooms portals also the writings riddles and the like to be seen in the whole castle are delineated now although we made some promise concerning this also yet at present i must contain myself and first learn to know the world better in every book stands its author painted whereof as i understood many were to be burnt that so even their memory may be blotted out from amongst the righteous now having taken a full view hereof and being scarce gotten forth another page came running to us and having whispered somewhat in our page's ear he delivered the keys to him who immediately carried them up the winding stairs but our page was very much out of countenance and we were setting hard upon him with entreaties he declared to us that the king's majesty would by no means permit that either of the two namely the library and sepulchres should be seen by any man and therefore he besought us as we tendered his life to discover it to no man he having already utterly denied it whereupon both of us stood hovering between joy and fear yet it continued in silence and no man made further inquiry about it thus in both places we consumed three hours which does not at all repent me now although it had been already struck in seven yet nothing was hitherto given us to eat howbeit our hunger was easy to be abated by constant revivings and i could be well content to fast all my life long with such entertainment about this time the curious fountains mines and all kinds of art shops were also shown us of which there was none but surpassed all of our arts though they should be all melted into one mass all their chambers were built in a semicircle so that they might have before their eyes the costly clockwork which was erected upon a fair turret in the centre and regulate themselves according to the course of the planets which were to be seen on it in a glorious manner and hence i could easily conjecture wherein our artists failed howbeit it's not of my duty to inform them at length i came into a spacious room shown indeed to the rest a great while before in the middle whereof stood a terrestrial globe whose diameter contained thirty foot albeit near half of it except a little which was covered with the steps was let into the earth two men might readily turn this globe about with all its furniture so that more of it was never to be seen but so much as was above the horizon now although i could easily conceive that this was of some special use yet i could not understand whereto those ringlets of gold served which were upon it in several places at which my page laughed and advised me to view them more narrowly in brief i found there my native country noted with gold also whereupon my companion sought his and found that so too now forasmuch as the same happened in a like manner to the rest who stood by the page told us of a certain that it was yesterday declared to the king's majesty by their old atlas so is the astronomer named that all the gilded points did exactly answer to their native countries according as had been shown to each of them and therefore he also as soon as he perceived that i undervalued myself and that nevertheless there stood a point upon my native country moved one of the captains to entreat for us that we should be set upon the scale without our peril at all adventures especially seeing one of our native countries had a notable mark and truly it was not without cause that he the page who had the greatest power of all the rest was bestowed upon me for this then i returned him thanks and immediately looked more diligently upon my native country and found moreover that besides the ringlet there were also certain delicate streaks upon it which nevertheless i would not be thought to speak to my own praise or glory i saw much more too upon this globe than i am willing to discover let each man take into consideration why every city produceth not a philosopher after this he led us quiet into the globe which was thus made on the sea there being large squares beside it was a tablet whereupon three dedications and the author's name which a man might gently lift up and by a little joined board go into the centre which was capable of four persons being nothing but a round board whereupon we could sit at ease in broad daylight it was already now dark contemplate the stars to my thinking they were mere carbuncles which glittered in an agreeable order and moved so gallantly that i had scarce any mind ever to go out again as the page afterwards told the virgin with which she often twitted me 
for it was already supper time and i had so much amused myself in the globe that i was almost the last at the table wherefore i made no longer delay but having again put on my gown which i had before laid aside and stepping to the table the waiters treated me with so much reverence and honour that for shame i durst not look up and so unawares permitted the virgin who attended me on one side to stand which she soon perceiving twitched me by the gown and so led me to the table to speak any further concerning the music or the rest of that magnificent entertainment i hold it needless both because it is not possible sufficiently to express it and i have above reported it according to my power in brief there was nothing there but art and amenity now after we had each to other related our employment since noon howbeit not a word was spoken of the library and monuments being already merry with the wine the virgin began thus my lords i have a great contention with one of my sisters in our chamber we have an eagle now we cherish him with such diligence that each of us is desirous to be the best beloved and upon that score have many a squabble on a day we concluded to go both together to him and toward whom he should show himself most friendly hers should be properly be this we did and i as commonly bear in my hand a branch of laurel but my sister had none now as soon as he espied us both he immediately gave my sister another branch which he had in his beak and offered up mine which i gave him now each of us hereupon imagined herself to be the best beloved of him which way am i to resolve myself this modest proposal of the virgin pleased us all mighty well and each one would gladly have heard the solution but inasmuch as they all looked upon me and desired to have the beginning for me my mind was so extremely confounded that i knew not what else to do with it but propound another in its stead and therefore said glorious lady your ladyship's question were easily to be resolved if one thing did not perplex me i had two companions both of which loved me exceedingly now they being doubtful which one of them was most dear to me concluded to run to me unaware and that he whom i should then embrace should be the right this they did yet one of them could not keep pace with the other so he stayed behind and wept the other i embraced with amazement now when they had afterwards discovered the business to me i knew not how to resolve myself and have hitherto let it rest in this manner until i may find some good advice herein the virgin wondered at it and well observed whereabout i was whereupon she replied well then let us both be quit and then desired the solution from the rest but i had already made them wise wherefore the next began thus in the city where i live a virgin was lately condemned to death but the judge being something pitiful towards her caused it to be proclaimed that if any man desired to become the virgin's companions he should have free leave to do it now she had two lovers the one presently made himself ready and came into the lists to expect his adversary afterwards the other also presented himself but coming somewhat too late he resolved nevertheless to fight and willingly suffer himself to be vanquished so that the virgin's life might be preserved which also succeeding according whereupon each challenged her now my lords instruct me to which of them of right belongeth she the virgin could hold no longer but said i thought to have gained much information and am myself gotten into the net but yet would gladly hear whether there be any more behind yes that there is answered the third a stranger adventure hath not yet been recounted than that which happened to myself in my youth i loved a worthy maid now that this my love might attain its wished end i was fain to make use of an ancient matron who easily brought me to her now it happened that the maid's brethren came in upon us just as we three were together who were in such a rage that they would have taken my life but on my vehement supplication they at length forced me to swear to take each one of them for a year to my wedded wife now tell me my lords should i take the old or the young one first we all laughed sufficiently at this riddle and though some of them muttered to one another thereupon yet none could undertake to unfold it hereupon the fourth began in a certain city there dwelt an honourable lady who was beloved by all especially by a young nobleman who would needs be too importunate with her at length she gave him this determination that in case he would in cold weather 
lead her into a fair garden of roses then he should obtain but if not he must resolve never to see her more the nobleman travelled to all countries to find such a man as might perform this till at length he lied upon a little old man that promised to do it for him in good case he would assure him of half his estate which he having consented to the other was as good as his word whereupon he invited the aforesaid lady home to his garden where contrary to her expectation she found all things green pleasant and warm and withal remembering her promise she only requested that she might once more return to her lord to whom with sighs and tears she bewailed her lamentable condition but forasmuch as he sufficiently perceived her faithfulness he dispatched her back to her lover who had so dearly purchased her that she might give him satisfaction this husband's integrity did so mightily affect the nobleman that he thought it a sin to touch so honest a wife so he sent her home again with honour to her lord now the little man perceiving such faith in both these would not how poor soever he were be the least but restored the nobleman all his goods again and went his way now my lords i know not which of these persons may have shown the greatest ingenuity here our tongues were quite cut off neither would the virgin make any other reply but only that another should go on wherefore the fifth without delay began my lords i desire not to make long work who hath the greater joy he that beholdeth what he loveth or he that only thinketh on it he that beholdeth it said the virgin nay answered i whereupon arose a contest before the sixth called out my lords i am to take a wife now i have before me a maid a married wife and a widow ease me of this doubt and i will afterwards help to order the rest it goes well there replied the seventh where a man hath his choice but with me the case is otherwise in my youth i loved a fair virtuous virgin from the bottom of my heart and she me in the like manner howbeit because of her friend's denial we could not come together in wedlock whereupon she was married to another yet an honest and discreet person who maintained her honourably and with affection until she came into the pains of childbirth which went so hard with her that all thought she had been dead so with much state and great mourning she was interred now i thought with myself during her life thou couldst have no part in this woman but yet now dead as she is thou mayst embrace and kiss her sufficiently whereupon i took my servant with me who dug her up at night now having opened the coffin and locked her in my arms and feeling about her heart i found still some motion in it which increased more and more from my warmth till at last i perceived that she was indeed still alive wherefore i quietly bear her home and after i had warmed her chilled body with a costly bath of herbs i committed her to my mother until she brought forth a fair son whom as the mother i caused faithfully to be nursed after two days she being then in a mighty amazement i discovered to her all the fore past affair requesting her that for the time to come she would live with me as a wife against which she thus expected in case it should be grievous to her husband who had well and honourably maintained her but if it could otherwise be she was the present obliged in love to one as well as the other now after two months being then to make a journey elsewhere i invited her husband as a guest and amongst other things demanded of him whether if his deceased wife should come home again he would be content to receive her and he affirming it with tears and lamentations at length i brought him his wife together with his son and an account of all the fore past business entreating him to ratify with his consent my forepurposed espousals after a long dispute he could not beat me from my right but was fain to leave me the wife but still the contest was about the son here the virgin interrupted him and said it makes me wonder how you could double the afflicted man's grief how answered he was i not then concerned upon this there arose a dispute amongst us yet the most part affirmed that he had done but right nay said he i freely returned both his wife and son now tell me my lords was my honesty or this man's joy the greater these words had so mightily cheered the virgin that as if it had been for the sake of these two she caused a health to go around after which the rest of the proposals went on somewhat perplexedly so that i could not retain them all yet this comes to my mind the one said that a few years before he had seen a physician 
who had brought a parcel of wood against the winter with which he warmed himself all winter long but as soon as the spring returned he sold the very same wood again and so had use of it for nothing here must needs be skill said the virgin but the time is now past yea replied my companion whoever understands not how to resolve all the riddles may give each man notice of it by proper messenger i conceive he will not be denied at this time they began to say grace and we rose all together from the table rather satisfied and merry than glutted and it were to be wished that all invitations and feastings were thus to be kept having now taken some few turns up and down the hall again the virgin asked us whether we desired to begin the wedding yes said one noble and virtuous lady whereupon she privately dispatched a page and yet in the meantime proceeded in discourse with us in brief she was already become so familiar with us that i adventured and requested her name the virgin smiled at my curiosity but yet was not moved but replied my name contains five and fifty and yet hath only eight letters the third is the third part of the fifth which added to the sixth will produce a number whose root shall exceed the third by itself by just the first and it is the half of the fourth now the fifth and the seventh are equal the last and the first are also equal and make with the second as much as the sixth half which contains just four more than the third tripled now tell me my lord how am i called the answer was intricate enough to me yet i left not off so but said noble and virtuous lady may i not obtain only one letter yea said she that may well be done what then replied i again may the seventh contain it contains said she as many as there are lords here with this i was content and easily found her name at which she was well pleased with assurance that much more should yet be revealed to us meantime certain virgins had made themselves ready and came in with great ceremony first of all two youths carried lights before them one of them was of jocund countenance sprightly eyes and genteel proportion the other looked something angrily whatever he would have must be as i afterwards perceived after them first followed four virgins one looked shamefacedly towards the earth very humble in behaviour the second also was a modest bashful virgin the third as she entered the room seemed amazed at somewhat and as i understood she cannot well abide where there is too much mirth the fourth brought with her certain small wreaths thereby to manifest her kindness and liberality after these four came two which were somewhat more gloriously apparelled they saluted us courteously one of them had a gown of sky colour spangled with golden stars the others was green beautified with red and white stripes on their heads they had a thin line to sadis, which did most becomingly adorn them at last came one alone who had on her head a coronet but rather looked up towards heaven than towards earth we all thought it had been the bride but were much mistaken although otherwise in honour riches and state she much surpassed the bride and afterwards ruled the whole wedding now on this occasion we all followed our virgin and fell down on our knees howbeit she showed herself extreme humble offering every one her hand and admonishing us not to be too much surprised at this for this was one of her smallest bounties but to lift up our eyes to our creator and learn thereby to acknowledge his omnipotency and so proceed in our enterprise course employing his grace to the praise of god and the good of man in some her words were quite different from those of our virgin who was somewhat more worldly they pierced even through my bones and marrow and thou she said further to me hast received more than others see that thou also make a larger return to me this was a very strange sermon for as soon as we saw the virgins with the music we imagined we must presently fall to dancing but that time was not yet as come now the waits whereof mention hath been before made stood in the same place wherefore the queen i yet not knew who she was commanded each virgin to take up one but to our virgin she gave her own which was the last and greatest and commanded us to follow behind our majesty was then somewhat abated for i well observed that our virgin was but too good for us and that we were not so highly reputed as we ourselves were almost in part willing to fantasy so we went behind in our order and were brought into the first chamber 
where our virgin in the first place hang up the queen's weight during which an excellent spiritual hymn was sung there was nothing costly in this room save only certain curious little prayer books which should never be missing in the midst was erected a pulpit very convenient for prayer where the queen kneeled down about her we were all fain to kneel and pray after the virgin who read out of a book that this wedding might tend to the honour of god and our own benefit afterwards we came into the second chamber where the first virgin hung up her weight also and so forward until all the ceremonies were finished hereupon the queen again presented her hand to every one and departed thence with her virgin our president stayed yet a while with us but because it had already been two hours night she would no longer detain us methought she was glad of our company yet she bid us good night and wished us quiet rest and so departed friendly although unwillingly from us our pages were well instructed in their business and therefore showed every man his chamber and stayed also with us in another pallet that in case we wanted anything we might make use of them my chamber of the rest i am not able to speak was royally furnished with rare tapestries and hung about with paintings but above all things i delighted in my page who was so excellently spoken and experienced in the arts that he yet spent me another hour and it was half an hour after three when i first fell asleep and this indeed was the first night that i slept in quiet and yet a scurvy dream would not suffer me to rest for i was all the night troubled with a door which i could not get open but at last i did with these fantasies i passed the time till at length towards day i awaked end of the third day recording by kirk ziggler ogden utah voiceovers by kirk dot com